Um, this event is hosted by, in these times, Verso Books, uh, New York Communities for Change, and New Economy Coalition, um, a number of organizations, some media, some organizing, um, who overlap in a number of ways, but especially tonight we're going to focus on climate justice. Um, hopefully you all received a, um, uh, a copy of In These Times Climate Issue. Uh, we put together over the last almost a year at this point, um, a, a full issue on climate change, which is our first ever, um, to our knowledge, our first ever themed issue uh, where every story front to cover was at the same, um, the same issue. And part of why we did that is because um, climate change, uh, and perhaps more than any other issue, sort of structures almost everything in our lives and will um, as it both continues to get worse and as our efforts to combat it um, increase. And um, there hasn't been a lot of talk about um, what exactly, um, until recently, about what exactly is needed to overcome the crisis. Uh, the Green New Deal has kind of created an opening around what our goals should be. And what we sought to do with this issue and sort of what we'll seek to do tonight um, is get a conversation going about kind of what more concretely is needed to actually get ourselves to zero and eventually even negative um, emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, so without uh, further ado, I'll introduce our moderator, um, who's Jamie Tyberg. She works for New York Communities for Change, uh, an organization that fights for climate justice and other issues. Um, and she also works uh, for the Climate Action Clubs, which is a, an after-school program on climate change with the High School, um, high school of Environmental Studies. Um, so thanks, Jamie. You have, you have yeah. a mic. Thanks everyone for coming and thank you Dayton and Verso and In These Times and the other co-sponsors of the event. I'm um, really happy to be here with our panelists tonight. Um, I'm gonna start with a quick land acknowledgement, um, a reminder that we are situated on stolen Lenape land um, and we pay respect to the Lenape people of the past, present and future um, and we offer our gratitude to the Lenape land and air and water um, all of which are being poisoned and polluted by our settlement here, um, and that we commit to rooting our organizing and decolonization and demilitarization of indigenous land all over the world. Um, and now I'll quickly go over some community agreements, which I'll also read before a QA. and a um, Since we are being joined by um, folks in person and on live stream from all walks of life, um, please refrain from using acronyms. Um, or you know, explain what they are if you're going to continue using the acronym. Um, and please also refrain from using any jargon. Um, but if some of you in the audience are having a hard time or are lost about something that one of the panelists are talking about, please use the jargon giraffe. Hold it up like this high. And if I see you, I'll make sure that we go over a clarification. Um, and when we get to questions, please remember that questions are not comments. Questions are questions. Um, and to always wait, which stands for why am I talking? Um, I think that really helps avoid a lot of um, just nonsense. Um, and now I will introduce our amazing panelists. Um, so Pete, to the farthest right. Um, Pete is a tremendously effective organizer um, who's been behind two of New York City's biggest climate campaign victories, um, one which was divestment and the other which was the recent buildings win that we'll discuss tonight. Um, and next to him is Kate. Um, she essentially invented climate journalism, as many of you know. Um, <laughs> and has a book coming out um, next year, this year. Next year. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, okay, wow, amazing. Um, and Ashley Dawson, writer um, of Extreme Cities and Extinction, um, who has very successfully merged climate activism with um, academia and is you know, creating a space for activism within his academia. Um, and you can follow all of them on Twitter. Yay! Great, so now let's get started. Um, I'm gonna direct this question to Pete, um, but anyone, you know, feel free to chime in. Um, 
and say whatever you would like to. Um, so, Pete. Okay. 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 So, New York City just passed a major climate legislation. Um, can you tell us more about what was won, what went into that campaign, and what can or should come next? Um, sure. It's a, it's, a, it's a big win, and it's the first law of its kind in the world. Um, Worldwide cities are 70% of climate pollution, and 40% um, of pollution worldwide is uh, a result of energy use in buildings, things that happen in buildings. In New York City, 70% of the climate pollution is coming from buildings. And of that, um, half of it is from just 2% of the largest real estate properties. It's buildings like Trump Tower. Um, big buildings in New York City are half of the pollution. Um, and fixing up those buildings, turning them into clean, high energy efficient buildings is a labor intensive job that creates a lot of work uh, for people. Um, so New York City just passed and we worked very hard to, to pass this in, in a coalition, um, uh, a law that will require large buildings over 25,000 square feet to slash their climate pollution at the pace and the scale um, of the climate crisis, that is um, at least 40% cuts by 2030 and over 80% uh, cuts in climate pollution by 2050, um, which sort of gives, you know, what the scientists say is like a 50-50 chance of, you know, avoiding total catastrophe. Um, uh, so, you know, that's a good thing. Um, it also, we call it a Green New Deal for New York because that involves um, many thousands of good career track jobs uh, employing people from communities of color, good union jobs that uh, you can build a, a life around. Um, so uh, we're really thrilled about it. The big losers here is the Real Estate Board of New York, the Rent Stabilization Association, the big corporate lobbies that have restrained this kind of action in New York City for a long time and in every city. Um, Mayor Bloomberg, um, who you know we take great issue with, as with Mayor de Blasio, but um, Mayor Bloomberg tried to pass something similar to this in 2009. He had no activist campaign behind it and just got crushed. Couldn't even get legislation uh, into the council and moving uh, to do something to cut that pollution. Um, but thanks to an activist campaign that united uh, the two powerful constituencies in New York politics, I think, that can move things, that is communities of color and predominantly white progressives that care about climate change, we were able to um, force the council and the mayor to act, and now we've got the world's uh, best law. It's not enough. It only affects large buildings, so, um, and it's uh, not as fast as it should be, but boy, it's a lot better than nothing, and we hope that other cities uh, pass something similar right away. So we have some thoughts on that, but um, basically what this involved was a very aggressive activist campaign uh, of targeting the council and the mayor uh, and pushing them to do this so that they would stop listening to the real estate industry and start listening to people. Yeah, um, and I think the big part about that campaign, which New York Communities for Change was a huge part of, was making sure that you know whatever the costs would be wouldn't be passed down to tenants. Yeah, that's right. So um, in New York City, a large uh, proportion of the housing, about two million people live in rent regulated housing. It's about a million units. And so there's obscure state law that many of you are probably familiar with uh, that allows landlords to stick people with permanent rent hikes for things called major capital improvements. So part of our big fight was to prevent that law from causing major capital improvements, therefore a pretext for rent hikes on hundreds of thousands of people. So rent regulated housing is treated differently from all other large buildings under this law. We hope to change state law at the end of this session. In fact, tomorrow you can go to Albany for a very militant and cool event to fight for uh, universal rent control. Um, but we really, at NYCC, we think climate change and inequality are inseparable, that those two issues really need to be treated together. Um, and so in this situation, I'll get a little spicy about it later, Climate re pollution reductions are directly pitted against affordable housing. 
And there were organizations like, I mean, I'll get, get spicy right now, but there were organizations that um, supposedly care about climate change and equity that were pushing to include rent-regulated housing in a way that would have caused mass rent hikes, which is insane on so many levels because there's 65,000 homeless people in New York City already. Nearly half of renters pay nearly half of their income in rent. We have an affordability crisis, but like, what's the point of fighting climate change if you aren't trying to help people? You want to actually help people and throwing them out of their homes doesn't actually help them. So um, there were large organizations that were not on our side on this issue. Um, the National Resources Defense Council is a good example. They were trying to include rent regulated housing in a way that would have caused rent hikes. Um, and also at the same time, they weren't in favor of super aggressive cuts in climate pollution on non rent regulated buildings. So we were fighting them on that. Um, in the end, they were irrelevant because they don't have any like boots on the ground or activists. Um, but fundamentally, it was really annoying and undermining to have them out there trying to sort of undercut us. That said, forget them. The main opponent here was the Real Estate Board of New York and the Rent Stabilization Association, all of their minions and allies. Um, so we can talk more about that. But it is very hard to beat big corporate lobbies with big money who can always kind of give an argument to delay action. Um, and there's always an easy way for politicians to say, uh, well, let's like, you know, we're a little worried about X, Y, Z aspect that some lobbyist is telling us as they pay us off. Well, in New York, we built the activist coalition that overcame that. That's what climate activists should do everywhere in the world. And we have to now enforce this law, make it actually real. But the law is now on the books, or it will be by the end of this week when it becomes law. And, um, and that's the first step to actually requiring buildings like Trump Tower to clean up their dirty acts. So um, it's not everything. It's only half of building square footage, half the pollution. There's a lot of other things involved, a lot of jobs that need to be created, lots and lots of things. But for New York City, for most cities, building energy use is villain number one. So if you want to get serious about fighting climate change, creating good jobs, this is the way to do it. This is what cities should do, and this is what activists should be thinking about. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm a rent to rant. Yeah. <laughs> and as someone who was, you know, behind the scenes on many of the grassroots campaigns um, that won, you know, what is your advice to people um, <coughs> when navigating an issue like climate change and fighting the climate crisis, where you know some sort of like national or international coordination is needed? but much of the effective organizing is done locally. Yeah, it's that. It's focus locally. Build power locally, build a multiracial coalition locally, put people in the streets. You know, I joke about this a lot, but it can be sort of awkward holding a sign and walking around in circles with 10 of your friends, like kind of chanting a slogan. It's a little weird fundamentally when you think about it, but that's what moves politicians. Those kinds of things are what moves them. And that enough of your friends doing that enough times, and it's not big numbers I'm talking about here, it's relatively small numbers that can translate kind of public opinion in the abstract, doesn't like pollution, wants jobs. But if you want to translate that abstract public opinion into actual results, you actually have to organize. And it doesn't take a lot of people, but you have to be ferocious about it and you have to stick to it and you need to do it over and over again and have a good plan. So local. Now, on top of that, I think that it's imperative that the federal government act, that we push corporations, climate finance, banks, fossil fuel companies, divestment, all those things are incredibly important as well. Um, but I think the foundation of it is local action to force the local, the municipality, or the state level government to act. You can make a much bigger difference there on a much shorter time scale than the federal government. And eventually you build towards that. So, you know, we're excited about the federal Green New Deal also. We will fight on that. We've done protests on it. We've done stuff. But, um, but uh, it really springs locally and, and statewide. And you have, and I think really important to build a multiracial coalition. Thank you, Pete. Um, speaking of the actions of the federal government, um, Kate, referring back to the climate issue that we are talking about today and celebrating today, um, 
your piece in here, uh, what struck me the most, I think, from your article was the figure of $20 billion of subsidies, of public money that we hand out to fossil fuel companies every year. Um, and then if you combine that with the defense budget of over $700 billion annually, you can really quantify how much the US government has invested in the destruction of our planet. Um, and now the divestment movement, I think, has been useful in highlighting those numbers and those investments, but it's obviously not enough, especially in actually reducing local source of emissions. Um, so in your expertise, what are some ways that we could sponsor you know, zero emissions, our transition to socialism, really? Um, you know, would that be through a public bank, which there is a lively campaign happening in New York City for a public bank? Uh, would it be taxing the rich, the polluters? Will it be a combination? It's not. Here, just use mine. So many mics. Great. Um, the other way. Uh, yeah, so I mean, as you mentioned, there is a sort of um, stunning figure which comes out of research from a group called Oil Change International, um, which finds that uh, between state and federal subsidies, the US government spends uh, around $20.5 billion a year propping up the fossil fuel industry effectively. And so this is things like the intangible drilling cost um, write off, which allows uh, companies to write off. Uh, what they spend, just sort of looking for new reserves that, of course, we know um, if we are going to stay within any sort of reasonable climate limit, um, cannot be dug up and burned, right? If we are to stay below two degrees, which is, um, for many people, uh, an unacceptably high level of warming, uh, we will need to keep about 80% of known coal, oil, and gas reserves in the ground. So that's just what we know exists already. That's not counting um, the, the many, many other sources of reserves that um, oil and gas companies especially are sort of always on the hunt for, or always looking um, to dig up and find. Um, so there's all of this sort of uh, spending that happens to tip the scales in the fossil fuel industry's favor. Um, sets so things like that, and there's all of these sort of other costs um, which add up actually to much, much more than that. So the IMF um, just recently put out a report, the, the sort of, you know, flagrant radicals at the IMF um, uh, found that there are $5.2 trillion in direct and indirect subsidies that go toward the fossil fuel industry every year. And so that's, you know, including many, many things. Um, so um, both those, those sorts of tax write-offs that I was just talking about, but also including um, things like, you know, the health impacts of, uh, of burning, burning these fuels, which are not accounted for in any, any meaningful way um, in, in their price, in sort of, um, you know, what, how governments kind of account for these things in a broad sense. $5.2 trillion. So that's, that's a lot of money that we shouldn't be um, spending on, uh, on this, this uh, fuel system, which is killing us. Uh, and so that's, that all seems sort of like common sense. Um, that you know we we should not be propping up propping up these industries as much uh, according to the Stockholm Environmental Institute um, as much as 50% of oil and gas extraction will be unprofitable um, if it weren't for these subsidies. Um, so there's a, a, a huge amount to which um, the industry really is dependent on. Uh, federal and state subsidies. So um, I have had uh, Exxon executives or Exxon spokespeople tell me um, to my face that uh, the reason um, they are not scared about uh, solar and wind outcompeting oil and gas is because uh, solar and wind is dependent on subsidies, and they aren't. Um, is that they are just um, these um, really sort of hyper productive rational actors that are you know always finding the most profitable source um, source of products uh, and the uh, solar and wind companies you know God bless them but they just can't can't seem to pay the bills um, and that's just not the case right um, the, the 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 fossil industry is hugely dependent um, on on government support so you know I think that's an important thing to just sort of have in the background as we talk about um, this question, which comes up a lot uh, when we talk about the Green New Deal, which is how do we pay for it, right? Um, that's the, the thing that sort of Republicans came out of the gate with um, as soon as the resolution was introduced in February, as soon as people began talking about the Green New Deal um, with uh, this great set in, in Nancy Pelosi's office in November. Um, and it's kind of an absurd question on its face, right? Because we never ask how we pay for, for you know, any number of national priorities. We never ask 
how much are we going to raise taxes when we go to war? You know, there was no great debate around, um, around the Iraq war, around the invasion of Afghanistan, um, to say, you know, how, uh, how much are we going to tax uh, the rich to invade, invade these countries? You know, which people are going to be the source of this income? We did it. We went to war, unfortunately. Um, but there was never, never sort of a consideration um, of that. There was never, uh, the, you know, really a conversation about that, um, about where are we getting this money when the Trump administration passed uh, $2 trillion um, in what is effectively stimulus um, through tax cuts. We can debate, you know, how much of that money is actually fueling um, decent economic activity, but um, from the sort of, you know, very flawed eyes of many economists, um, that was stimulus. Um, and so there are, you know, these two big constraints which, uh, which economists, which um, sort of pundits like to bring up when we talk about big levels of spending on the order um, of something like a Green New Deal, which are just totally fake, and they've been proven fake in the last several years. And so one of those, um, right, is taxes. So how many, um, uh, you know, how, how much do we need to raise taxes in order to pay for something? Um, there's this great myth that, uh, you know, I think is rooted maybe in, in the sort of 90s debate around the budget. Um, and I think it was someone like Frank Luntz who came up with this line that uh, the, uh, the, the American people sit around their kitchen table every day and they make these tough choices about um, how to balance their bucks. Uh, and they, you know, constrain their spending to meet their balanced budgets. Well, um, that, you know, has proven to be a very effective line uh, in, in uh, enforcing austerity, basically, and saying, you know, if the American people have to balance their books, why doesn't the federal government? Well, the American people don't have access to a central bank. Um, we, you know, you or I cannot uh, print money by virtue of ta uh, typing in um, a few keys on a computer, which is um, what the federal government does every day. We can create money, we can spend money, um, and in the United States, we're in a remarkably sort of um, privileged position to be able to do that um, in that we, uh, we you know, issue uh, debt in our own currency. And so there is not sort of a scenario in which the United States go bankrupt. Um, there is no one-to-one -one relationship between the amount of tax tax uh, income that we take in and the amount of spending we can do. Um, there's also, you know, if, if you're not sort of uh, worried about how much taxes will go up, another thing you will hear is that um, the deficit will go up, right? Is that um, we have this unsustainable level of debt um, that uh, we can't possibly spend more, that that is a burden to be passed on to future generations um, that's unfair to them. Uh, which is also a lie and also something while the GOP likes to roll it out um, every time sort of Democrats come to power um, that they themselves have not uh, really cared much about in, in the practice of governance. So I think the um, uh, Ronald Reagan was maybe the biggest deficit spender uh, of uh, the last several presidents, uh, maybe I think more than Obama or slightly less than Obama and FDR. Um, Reagan spent the most. Um, Republican administrations for the last several decades have reliably spent more um, than Democratic administrations, and yet whenever they are out of power, they um, sort of hammer Democrats over the head by saying, "You are spending too much money. You're being wasteful. It costs the American people all this money. All this money." Um, so that's you know not true, and it's very nakedly sort of a um, political thing. And also uh, the sheer size of the federal deficit doesn't matter in itself. What matters um, is what we're spending that on. What's, what matters is whether we're setting up the economy to do well over the long term, which a Green New Deal, um, which sort of massive investment uh, in decarbonizing the economy would obviously um, bring about. So we do, that's not to say that we don't have any limits on what we can spend. There are, of course, limits. And, and one of those limits is, of course, inflation. Um, and so you can spend, uh, you know, as much as you need to, to get what's technically feasible done, to confront this massive existential challenge. Um, and the reason you know that you may be spending too much is uh, because inflation will rise, right? This hasn't happened um, remarkably uh, as we have poured $2 trillion into the economy for tax cuts for the wealthy. And we have not seen uh, inflation. The Fed has been actually unable to meet its inflation targets um, for the last several years. And so that's um, a constraint which, you know, has not um, been a problem and I think shows that we do really have um, space in our economy to spend what we need to, um, again, to avert civilizational collapse, which is um, the sort of uh, grand mission of 
uh, something like a Green New Deal. And so we have the money available in the federal government to do it. There's no reason we can't do it. Um, I can get into a lot, uh, <laughs> a lot more wonky questions about that um, later, but um, there is no reason why we cannot uh, why in you know, the, one of the wealthiest countries that has ever existed, um, we cannot devote resources toward taking on the greatest threat humanity has ever known. Um, and anyone who tells you otherwise is, is lying. Thank you, Kate. Kate is an aspiring economist, by the way. Which means I'm in grad school. Inspired economist. <laughs> um, Next question is for Ashley, um, and I'm very excited to ask this because anyone who knows me knows that I love to talk about the US military being the biggest polluter on earth. Um, so in your piece for this In These Times issue, you write that a campaign for a global Green New Deal would require challenging the intrastate economic and military competition upon which capitalism relies. Um, and essentially that we can't have this current extractive system continue that's simply powered by renewables but must be dismantled overall. Um, so in your experience of you know, working with both activists and organizers and academics, um, what can we be doing right now to address this and also to avoid that we simply replicate our existing structures that is just off fossil fuels. Okay, great. Um, hi everyone, good evening. Thank you for that question, Jamie. Um, so I want to begin answering your question, um, hopefully with a comment that dovetails with what Kate was just saying and, and with your wonderful and very important land acknowledgement uh, that you began the panel with. Um, last year, I was very fortunate to work with activists of the Ramapo Lenape people who live in Mawa, New Jersey, uh, not that far north of here, about an hour's drive north of here. Um, uh, I was part of a group that brought members of the Lumi Nation from the Pacific Northwest who are fighting all sorts of extractive projects going across their land um, uh, from the um, coal uh, power um, uh, river basin and other places. Um, and they've been doing these amazing transcontinental uh, journeys with totem poles that they carve um, to Canada and parts of the United States to mobilize water protectors. So they came to Ramapo to help them fight against a pipeline that was going in um, across the Hudson, uh, across Ramapo territory. Just to give you the idea that um, the Ramapo um, are still alive, they're here close to us and still fighting very important struggles. And of course their struggles are very much connected to all of our struggles because we live in a moment of massive overproduction of fo fossil fuels. You know, all the time we hear in the news that renewable energy is increasing and that we just need to let the market do its magic and, you know, solar and wind will outcompete coal and um, other forms of fossil fuels. But of course, as Kate pointed out, there's massive state subvention for fossil fuels. And um, as, a, as a result of that, there are pipelines going in everywhere to export particularly fracked gas and oil from places like the Marcellus Shale in western Pennsylvania and the Permian Basin in Texas to centers of population um, like New York City and beyond that to um, places where uh, gas and oil are not so cheap, like the European Union and East Asia. So um, the struggles of folks like the Ramapo are incredibly important. And in researching the fracking industry, I actually found out that um, the state subvention is quite startling in its extent. You know, that the fracking industry was not economically productive and probably wouldn't have gotten going were it not for the ways in which the big banks, which got bailed out, you probably remember the uh, TARP, the Troubled Assets, what is it called? Relief, Relief Program, thank you, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I prom you, you made us promise not to use any acronyms, but of course I only remember the acronym, not what it stands for. Um, yeah, the way in which basically the ba big bank bailout, which went not just to the banks that were in economic trouble in 2008 and afterwards, but to many other major banks, was used by those banks. You know, they turned around and lent the money to fracking companies and basically gave them a lifeline and got them going. 
And the other way that they've been able to survive is because of the very low interest rates that the Federal Reserve has locked in place ever since then, right? And of course, Trump has been complaining that uh, when the Federal Reserve has tried to raise interest rates. So there are these ways in which the US state has continued to support fracking and fossil capitalism more broadly, which might not be all that evident, but which are extremely insidious. Nonetheless, um, fracking companies are massively in debt and many of them are fairly precarious. Um, so the kind of activism which folks like the Ramapo are engaging in and which people, maybe many of you in this room, um, are doing to stop the Williams pipeline here in New York and the many other pipelines in this region is extremely important given that precariousness of the fracking industry. So I just wanna sort of, uh, in terms of the question of what to do concretely, you know, to, to engage in that activism to, um, be able to slow down the building of these pipelines, every extra day is a massive hit to these uh, companies' bottom line. And as I said, a lot of them are quite precarious in their finances, so it's really important to engage in that kind of struggle. Um, two other thoughts that I'll um, try to articulate in relation to your, your question, which come out of my piece for In These Times. And incidentally, I just want to take a second to thank In These Times for running this excellent issue, um, and to Dayton um, and other folks at In These Times for the, the really wonderful work um, that went into the issue. Uh, the editing uh, back and forth that I had with Dayton and others uh, was really superb and, yeah, really generative. So thank you, In These Times. Um, so what I tried to do in the piece um, was to emphasize that what we need in this moment is revolutionary reforms rather than reformist reforms, right? So in my piece, I basically said that socialism is the only way we're going to be able to save the planet. Um, I didn't want to be mistaken, though, by saying, well, we need to wait until we've overthrown capitalism before we do anything to, you know, engage in activism around environmental issues. But what what I did want to emphasize is that we shouldn't fall into the trap of kind of reformist reforms. And just to give you a concrete example of what I'm talking about, think about carbon taxes, right? You know, the right wing and big capital um, uh, at the moment is engaged, on, at least on a federal level, in climate change denial in the US. Um, that's not true in most of the rest of the world, and eventually it won't be true in the US. And so what the right is beginning to do is to think about its next steps and how it will fight once a more centrist or leftist administration comes to power on the federal level. And of course, what they're beginning to do is advocate carbon taxes. The problem is that carbon taxes usually are not high enough to make the difference that they need to make. You know, the IPCC in their 1.5 degree report from last October called for carbon taxes that were um, literally thousands of dollars for every ton. Um, and the taxes that have been proposed so far, for instance, in Washington State's uh, initiative back in November are much, much lower on the order of like $30 a ton, right? They're just not high enough. So the IPCC was essentially saying we need to bankrupt fossil fuel companies by having taxes that are so high. And I think that the big oil companies that are backing carbon taxes are banking on the fact that if they are advanced, they just won't be high enough. Um, and that consequently, they'll be able to keep doing business as usual. And we've seen this kind of model on an international playing field with the negotiations uh, at the UN around climate change, you know, with cap and trade and United Nations RED, which is the deforestation initiative, all kind of neoliberal market-based solutions that haven't fundamentally shifted the, the calculus. So, um, uh, and, and the other issue, of course, is that we see that these kinds of reforms really hit everyday people. So um, the uh, gilets jaunes, the yellow vest, uprisings in France are really, although it's a complex phenomenon and contradictory in lots of different ways, but at the core of that uprising is a sense that efforts to combat climate change by Macron from a kind of elitist background that involve putting taxes in place that affect average workers and average people in France are extremely regressive, and so there's been a populist uprising against that. Uh, so there's the danger that carbon taxes, um, even if we try and put in place mechanisms that will somehow offset their impact on ordinary people, uh, will not 
secure the kind of popular uh, assent um, and uh, support that we really need. And I think that's why the Green New Deal is such an important alternative and we really need to push revolutionary reforms within the context of the Green New Deal. Um, the last thing I, I'll just say very quickly is about something I've been thinking about um, having to do with how to relate to state power, right? I mean, the Green New Deal as a proposal, I think, is extremely exciting because it's a set of proposals and provocations about how the left should try to mobilize power in relation to the, to the state. I mean, we heard from Pete the kind of amazing work that he and uh, other activists have been doing in a, on a local level um, and the successes that he's been having. And of course, the Green New Deal is an attempt to do something quite similar on a federal level. And I think it raises important questions which the left and intellectuals have not really been thinking about in a long time. And that is, you know, what do we do if we win? How do we win? What kind of strategy should we pursue? And um, how are we going to relate to state power uh, in a way that means that we are not co-opted um, by the state, right? Which um, historically, of course, has been the vehicle for uh, expressing elite interests. Um, so I've been thinking a lot recently about um, uh, what might be called uh, Generation Left. Keir Milburn, a British guy, has a recent book that's quite interesting that's talking about the way in which a whole young generation of people like the Sunrise Movement have come back to leftist politics um, and thinking about putting pressure on the state after, uh, for instance, the Occupy Wall Street movement basically eschewed engagement with state power. So I think he's trying to pinpoint a kind of important pivot that's going on. Um, and then one is one that's very different from what's happened for you know, much of the last 20 or 30 years, arguably since the end of really existing communism, you know, and the kind of globalization of capitalist power that resulted in a whole series of historical defeats for the left and a kind of um, withdrawal into anarchist politics and kind of localist politics in the worst possible sense of the term. Um, so, and we can debate this in questions and answers, of course, but um, what I'm suggesting is that there's a very interesting shift towards a real re-engagement with the state on all different scales and that we need to be thinking carefully about this, um, uh, particularly given the precedent in Latin America where um, parties like the Workers' Party um, in uh, Brazil tried to um, gain state power and also have large social movements that were putting pressure on their kind of electoral wing. Um, and we're able to make massive changes, but of course now have been defeated and we have a, a really extreme right wing administration in, in power. So in the US, as the left becomes more powerful, how do we think these kind of strategic questions through? How do we avoid falling into the kind of trap of a kind of Leninist dual power where we think of the state as just something over there that we need to organize our power in opposition to and take over or smash or something like that? How can we think about the state as a kind of um, variegated, heterogeneous phenomenon with elements of kind of um, histories of working class and other um, dissenting movements have engaged, uh, um, gained some uh, purchase on, um, and then use our own movements to further that transformation. Um, so these are some of the questions which I think would be useful to think about on a kind of broader theoretical plane as we think about the practicalities of what a Green New Deal should look like and how we can bring it about. Thanks. Thank you. Speaking of state power, uh, my last question for all of the panelists is um, so that we can end on a more imaginative spirit. Um, if folks didn't hear Jay Inslee, a um, presidential hopeful, um, who's no Mike Revelle, but he did announce his Climate Conservation Corps plan. Um, and so I wanted to ask the three of you, if you could run your own Climate Conservation Corps, what activities would you establish for all of Americans to get busy with? Anything from sending Henry Kissinger and other war criminals to The Hague, or restoring phytoplankton, um, which generates enough oxygen that it accounts for one of every five breaths that we take. Pete, you want to start? No. No. <laughs> I'd be happy to start. Okay, let's um, start with Ashley. Okay, well, 
I'm actually a professor of English, so um, <laughs> uh, despite the fact that I'm weighing in on environmental issues and issues relating to political theory, um, nonetheless, my, my origin is in thinking about culture and ideology and how to shift um, dynamics in society through culture. So I would definitely um, try to get something going again that would be the equivalent of the New Deal's WPA, where artists were mobilized to be part of the struggle. And I want to give a kind of shout out to a wonderful play that was put on um, by the Federal Theater Project in 1937, and it was called Power. Um, and it's a wonderful play on words, but of course it, it was basically laying out how corrupt the investor-owned utilities of the era were, how they were fleecing the average American, and most importantly, how they were refusing to extend power to rural areas, because in their opinion, it was not economically advantageous. Um, now, the Federal Theater Project was witch-hunted. It was one of the first organizations that, from the New Deal that got really shut down by the kind of incipient McCarthyite um, push um, against the New Deal. Uh, they were shut down in 1938, so only one year after power was produced here in New York City. But the play helped, uh, it toured over the United, all over the United States, local theaters put on versions of it, and I think it helped to really disseminate popular awareness of how corrupt the IOUs, the investor-owned utilities, were. And by the way, we still have investor-owned utilities. Con Ed is not for the public benefit, it's to make money for its shareholders, and it is not helping the green transition go fast enough, it's part of the problem. Um, so there, it's high time for another kind of popular their consciousness disseminating project where we fit, you know, let people know how corrupt these institutions are. And the other thing that the play power talked about was um, the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, um, which was being um, fought out actually all the way up to the level of the Supreme Court at the time because the big power corporations were trying to say that it was illegal for the government to run some kind of power providing authority. And of course, eventually um, FDR and the TVA prevailed. Um, while the TVA is not a perfect um, organization by any means, uh, it runs lots of you know fossil um, power plants today. Nonetheless, I think it's an important model for how we might transform this country beyond a kind of municipal level to um, uh, energy democracy and renewable energy, how we could really think about regional massive transformation. Um, so I think it provides a model for what a shift to green energy might look like. And making people aware of these kind of aspirations and possibilities, as well as aware of how corrupt the current system is and how dysfunctional it is, I think is a really important role for radical cultural workers. So I would love to see a kind of, you know, CCA or a WPA, something like that, that mobilize cultural workers to help people understand these things and help uh, create a mass movement because that's what we need right now. Before we get to Kate, just another plug. Um, DSA Eco-Socialist NYC is wor working a con ed campaign or anti-con ed campaign called Public Power if folks wanna get involved. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I would second everything Ashley said. Um, I think that the Civilian Conservation Corps is really um, such an interesting model um, to look back on. I mean, in addition to things like um, the Works Progress Administration and the Federal Writers Project and the Federal Theater Project, um, in that it really you know, took seriously the fact that being in nature is like an inherently good and joyful thing um, that you know, like improves people's lives in a, in a really um, considerable way. And I think in, in thinking about you know, what a version of that might look like for the 21st century, um, I really you know, recently rediscovered um, uh, some of like the, the sort of uh, founding ethos of, of the Clean Water Act. Uh, which was to um, to make all water in the United States, uh, I think the, the words were fishable and swimmable um, by 1985. Of course, that didn't happen, um, but uh, it's a it's a kind of inspiring vision, right? That you know these uh, waters that flow through our lands, 
um, are really public resources um, that aren't, you know, just something um, for us to turn our taps on and to meet our sort of basic subsistence of drinking water and, you know, bathing ourselves and all this stuff. They're, you know, these real sort of sites um, of joy in some ways. And they're these places to be, you know, these, these resources to be enjoyed. And so I think um, something I would be excited for um, in a civilian conservation corps, which would, of course would, um, I hope, you know, coincide uh, with something like a federal jobs guarantee where um, the maximum number of hours someone could work would be, you know, anywhere from 20 to 35, you know, even lower if we're getting really ambitious. Um, because people just, you know, don't need to be working as much as they are now if we don't have an economy that's oriented um, around producing massive amounts of useless stuff. Um, we, can, <laughs> we can work much less um, and really have time to enjoy um, our mountains, our lakes, our coastlines, and, and all these things. And so um, I think a Civilian Conservation Corps can make those um, really sites of leisure, make these sort of neglected um, federal lands Lands, um, and you know the places like um, like the beaches along the Jersey Shore. I grew up in southern New Jersey, um, and there are you know we have this beautiful public resource that more people should get to enjoy. And so if we had um, you know a functional public transit system which could ferry people between uh, big cities and coasts, um, you know it would be a, a wonderful thing to just have. Uh, you know, the casino economy of Atlantic City converted into uh, a leisure economy for, um, you know, people to come and enjoy um, in, uh, you know, I think it's not, it's not a perfect example. History doesn't give us blueprints. It gives us lessons. But um, in the, the former Yugoslavia, um, almost every worker just had a, like a, a place, like an apartment along the Dalmatian coast um, that were part of these, like, beautifully designed um, apartment complexes um, where you can just enjoy the sort of um, wonderful Mediterranean climate um, in your, you know, ample vacation time. And so I would love to see some version of that for the United States where, you know, working people can just go, um, and, you know, it's not a luxury, you don't have to, you know, spend uh, half your, half your, you know, month's paycheck flying to some exotic locale, you can go enjoy the sort of nature that's all around us um, and just, you know, go swim, go to, you know, bars, whatever, like eat wonderful meals, um, but really, you know, have, um, have our, our sort of uh, public infrastructure um, built to have people enjoy, enjoy, enjoy the country. That's a beautiful country that we live in. Um, and I think that's, you know, the, the sort of promise a Green New Deal has is that, you know, if all these sort of pieces fit together, um, pub, you know, investment in public transit, shorter work hours, um, you know, making sure people have health care so we can actually can enjoy things and, you know, uh, that all those pieces fit together are really the sort of foundations for a more enjoyable life. Um, it's not, you know, what um, we've been told climate action is for so long, which is us sacrificing things and giving things up. Um, really, it's, it's about um, uh, investing in a better life, investing in a, a low carbon life that is, um, on the whole, just a more, a more enjoyable one overall than the sort of hellscape that we live in now. <laughs> the hellscape. <laughs> um, you know, I think this is outside of my wheelhouse. I don't really know this that well, but I'm gonna try and take it head Imagination. on. Imagination. You know, yeah, exactly. Use the brain a little. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of jobs you could employ people in that would be productive. They're not conventionally productive because they're not, you know, the doggy daycare or the, you know, or the $200 million latest fighter bomber production, uh, but they're productive in a way that's good for society. So whether it's taking care of aged people or um, going on a block by block basis to uh, talk to people and get them to uh, compost and upgrade their homes to energy efficiency, um, you know, there's a lot of work that could be done out there. It's a WPA for writers or any of the things that we've, we've just talked about. Um, I don't think there's a lack of good ideas. Um, I do think there um, is a, um, it would be important to think through how that can be high skill work and how it can be, you know, kind of not to use a, you know, buzzy word, but scaled up to the level at which it can be done productively so that there's a lot of training provided and a lot of supervision so it's uh, done well rather than low skill jobs, you know, taking tickets at the museum. Um, something like that, right? So it's, it's actually high-skilled work. People are gaining productive knowledge. Um, but I, I think that we can win these kinds of things 
um, with uh, focused and aggressive um, activism directed at particular elected officials who make these decisions and can be made to do this stuff. Um, so, you know, that's I think the really important part. Um, I see a few people in the audience who I see at protests routinely. And you know what? We just won big in New York City. And I think on Thursday, I, I'm just going to go out and say it, Joe Namath style. We are going to win on the Williams motherfucking pipeline, I think. <laughs> and, I, I, you know, I, I think we're going to win. And I think we're going to win because we have made the governor feel the pressure on it. Um, and, you know, we, we, we're, we're building it in New York. Now, we got a long way to go. Um, and I could be completely wrong. Um, there's a very strong late push by the utilities and Williams itself to uh, screw the world. But, um, <laughs> you know, but I think we're going to win. And I, I think we're going to win because we're building power in New York City. It's a blue place, so we don't have to deal with these fucking stupid Republicans, right? But even in those places, you can win through these kinds of tactics. So um, I, I just think it's like really important to do that. Thanks, Pete. Cool. That's it, folks. No, I'm kidding. We'll do questions <laughs> now um, because we want to hear from you all. Um, and I'll just repeat the community agreements again. Um, please don't use acronyms, or if you're going to use them, please you know, explain the meaning. Um, when we say questions, we mean questions and not comments. The Q and Q&A stands for questions. Um, and before you raise your hand, remember, wait. Why am I talking? Great. Questions? Thank you, Ann. Or, yeah. Me? Okay. Yeah, go thank ahead. you. Um, just one thank you for everyone on the panel. One thing I really appreciated that a couple of people mentioned the issue of state power and, it, and mentioned situations that we're going to have to face where progressive values conflict with other progressive values. Um, obviously, we have to do a tremendous amount in a very short period of time. It's like, a, and people have described it as a war, a World War II level mobilization. And the government is going to need to be able to do a lot really quickly. And most of our checks and balances on government power are about slowing things down. Democracy is slow, checks and balances are slow, you see the government, it takes years. We, we kind of can't afford, we don't have the luxury of that. I know I work, I know this here work with Extinction Rebellion. One of the, the principles is like a citizens committee of people chosen by lots to oversee, which is not anything I think since ancient Greece anyone has done. Like, so I don't know how people think about it. Is it, it's kind of a, a a luxurious problem to have, like we're succeeding too much, but how do you think about um, the risks of having concentrated power that we need and not uh, with the normal human tendency for that to go very, very badly? Do we want to answer that or take one more? Uh, yeah, yeah, take a couple. More. All right, let's take one or two more. In the back. Sure. So what, what exact realms again? Do you mind repeating? So medicine, medicine. And I guess like biomedical academia, but academia I feel like is pretty similar all throughout. Mm -hmm. okay. One more or answer them. Yeah. Yeah, um, my question is one about uh, the price impacts of things like 
case of congestion pricing in New York, looms large at the moment. Um, Commonwealth's argument, Charles Commonwealth is uh, the guy who's done the analysis behind the uh, congestion pricing. Um, his argument is a simple one that uh, by introducing a congestion price um, for a lot of people uh, that are, you know, that come into New York, that are quite high income, uh, it's not regressive. If that revenue is then distributed to the MTA system for improving the subways. Um, how do you respond to that? And couldn't that same example be used in terms of the carbon price? Cool. So the questions were on the tendency of power concentrations to go badly when centralized action is needed. And how can we institutionalize climate equity in medicine and the field of academia? And kind of lost on the third one. <laughs> Congestion <laughs> pricing is a model. Congestion yeah. pricing is a model for raising carbon prices and distributing revenue. Okay, got it. All right. Who wants to take what? I'll start blathering. <laughs> why am I talking? I don't know. I'm on the panel, though. Hey, <laughs> that's why I'm talking. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I think on, on carbon prices, on pricing schemes like that, I think they're most helpful to be thought of as what do they raise money for, and do they are they regressive or are they progressive? So we think the congestion pricing, NYCC, we think it's a good idea um, because it falls heavily on people who can afford it, um, and it funds things that are good for communities. Um, so we don't think of it as a climate solution, per se. Um, and I think that's, that's important. This is the same thing. Yeah, that's a side effect, exactly, is a good way of putting it. The gentleman said that's a side effect. Yeah, uh, that's right. It's a good one. Um, so uh, to take your question on concentrated state power, um, you know, I, I personally think it is big government time, um, you know, to actually force these solutions and fast. Um, so, uh, but there is a real balance between democracy and, and how do you do this? Um, and so to me, it's very common sense that you don't wanna hurt people in this process, that you wanna help people. Um, so the, uh, a, a good way to arrive at that is democratically created solutions. Um, generally speaking, I think public opinion is a good guide on this stuff and we have to actualize it. I'm a big fan of Extinction Rebellion, even though it's very, very white. I think it's still really a good thing. It's like out there, like putting your body on the line, blocking traffic, great, let's, let's raise the alarm because the general public is not at all aware of how hard the crisis is. Um, so I think it's very, very valuable for that at a, at a bare minimum. Um, and then in terms of the, the medical profession, I think it has a really unique role as you know, people look up to their doctors, uh, they look up to medicine. Um, maybe they shouldn't, but they do. Um, and uh, they should, I'm not, I'm not saying they shouldn't. Um, so I, I think that uh, doctors and, and medical students ought to be like real moral leaders and actually start to, to fight on these issues rather than um, you know, trying to afford a BMW. Um, I know that's not what you're doing, but I think that's what, what, um, what a lot of uh, medical people are doing, and it's a, it's a crying shame. Um, so that's my answer. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go for the um, question about democracy first, which is, a, I think, a massive one in part. You know, we have to, as you said, do a lot of things very quickly, and our government is not designed to do things particularly quickly. Um, and I think, you know, I think there's, there's sort of like small d democracy and like what are the institutions that are entrusted to like uh, perform democracy in the United States, which we have, you know, I think are two very different questions. Like the Senate, for instance, I would not characterize as a democratic institution, right? It's an institution that is part of American democracy in sort of a capital letter sense, but um, was designed to um, disempower massive numbers of people and is not representative. Um, and so I think, you know, in thinking about what we will likely have to do over the next couple of years, which to, is to uh, get a lot of policy into place. Um, I think, you know, thinking about small D democracy and prioritizing that over what I imagine will be an argument coming from the right um, is that we are, you know, offending uh, American democracy if we are, you know, doing things like getting rid of the filibuster, um, if we are talking about things like abolishing the Senate, um, if we are talking about things like adding Supreme Court justices. You know, these are, I think, 
not being so faithful to like what um, uh, the United States is like uh, big D democratic institutions are um, is hugely important, and I think that you know I imagine being a big argument from the right, and that you know you are looking to disenfranchise the fossil fuel industry. Well, you know the fossil fuel industry is also looking to disenfranchise um, generation after generation, and is actively making people's lives harder in the here and now. Um, and so I think sort of expanding the concept of democracy and, and thinking about it um, in a more expansive way, I think then. Um, some of the sort of frustrating conversations that have come up after Trump's election um, around, you know, the threat to our democratic institutions and, um, you know, how uh, democracy is not under threat, whatever. I mean, I would give a shout out to a book that came out recently um, by Astor Taylor, Democracy Does Not Exist, uh, Democracy May Not Exist, But We'll Miss It When It's Gone, um, which sort of digs into those questions in part um, through um, thinking about, uh, about climate change and, and, and some pieces of it. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's a big question. How do we, you know, think, uh, re reimagine like what democracy looks like? Because we don't have, we don't really live in a democracy um, mm -hmm. right now in any meaningful sense. Um, I think on the, the Pricing impact, I don't have too much to add to what Pete said. Um, I do think at the state level at least, what has, what pricing programs have been successful at doing, I'm thinking about Reggie and um, cap and trade in California, is they're not very good at bringing down emissions, but they are good at raising revenue. And um, that revenue has been put into, you know, at least in the case of California, some like reasonably great programs. Um, even if the program as a whole is sort of um, a, a sort of complicated beast and not, again, not good at bringing down emissions. Um, I do think, you know, finding ways to direct state, especially at the state and city level where, um, you know, you don't really have the kind of flexibility of the federal level um, to raise raise revenue. Um, I think those those programs can be really good. And I, and I think, you know, congestion pricing is, is a great idea for, for New York in particular. Um, so finding ways like that. And it, it wasn't, you know, framed as a carbon tax also. Like, and I think that helped it probably. Um, on uh, climate equity, I mean, I, this is not a world I know a, a ton about, but I personally have been really inspired by the work of the nurses' unions um, in sort of pushing forward um, really sort of ambitious climate policy, in part because they, you know, have seen um, in a really visceral sense the impact of um, climate impacts, um, you know, from the California Nurses Association sort of dealing with the California wildfires um, to nurses whose hospitals were closed down in the aftermath of Sandy in New York. Um, I think that has been reliably sort of some of the most um, inspiring uh, work happening on the climate front. And people, you know, like nurses <laughs> more than, uh, I think it's, you know, the most trusted profession um, in, in the country. And so really seeing nurses as, as, a, as a way forward and, you know, I think, we can think about hospitals and, and sort of uh, the health world as a, as a place of class conflict as well. Um, and so really looking toward, you know, what are the sort of um, working class struggles that we can, we can support in, in, that, in that sense. And, and uh, at least as that has looked in the last couple of years, that has, you know, aligned with a sort of low carbon vision. And, and um, to say that, you know, I think um, nursing in particular is a great example of the kind of low carbon job and a Green New Deal should look to um, put a lot of resources into um, and thinking about the health professions as, you know, as low carbon work um, on, you know, across, you know, from um, technicians to, to doctors and surgeons uh, on up. And so really, you know, thinking about that as we, as we think about, you know, a, a transition into a, um, away from our extractive economy. Um, okay. Uh, Great comments by my fellow panelists. I'll try and add a tiny bit um, in each of these three questions. Um, so yeah, the question of democracy and the state, it seems to me it, it's great that the left is coming back to these questions, both in terms of practical politics, you know, with groups like um, the Sunrise Movement um, uh, and Movement Generation trying to think through these questions actually in their practice. Um, and there's also been, I think, a profusion of theoretical efforts to think this through, um, thinking about books like Hegemony, How To, I think there's one called This Is An Insurrection, and John Paolo Bialki's um, We The Sovereign, thinking about Latin America and the history of movements in Latin America. So, um, as well as um, Kier Milburn's book, um, Generation Left. So, you know, I think there's a kind of international return to these questions with, um, you know, the, the Occupy movement um, and the contemporary climate um, justice movement very much in mind. Um, so folks are trying to figure this out. And so as we think about um, winning state power and about the necessity for like 
wielding big state power, we also have to be thinking about these questions of maintaining democracy, you know, not having some kind of climate Maoism with all the dysfunction that can come with that, um, and having a whole series of different scales um, of uh, democratic kind of effervescence happening. And so I think some of the examples um, of the victories that Pete was describing and the kind of tactics that um, uh, Pete and Jamie are engaging in um, in their organizations here in New York are a great example um, of uh, kind of mobilizing on different scales and the importance of uh, particularly the municipal scale um, as a, a site for experimentation and for kind of uh, winning victories that can then be parlayed onto a federal scale and hopefully also, of course, an international scale because if we don't have a global Green New Deal, we're all screwed. Um, in terms of congestion pricing, um, you know, my, my critique in my article of um, uh, carbon taxes ultimately is that there's not enough democracy involved. Um, that what we really need to do is nationalize um, the fossil fuel companies, buy them out, and you know, with a plan to wind them down, right? Um, and one could say something about um, congestion pricing. You know, the historical resistance in New York City to congestion pricing was because it was a kind of uh, implicit tax on working class populations in the outer boroughs. And I think a lot of people still feel, you know, upset about that. So while I, I certainly believe in congestion pricing, and I think it's a good thing, um, I would like to see it as a, a first step towards an effort to ban cars in many parts of the city and to have a free public transportation system, you know, and to have parks on every other avenue, you know, rather than having cars going up and down them. So, um, and, and I'm not just, uh, you know, talking uh, my rear end when I say this kind of thing, you know, um, in Barcelona, for instance, there's a very vibrant movement to take over a third of the city and make it car free, and they've been winning real victories. So th this is a kind of movement that um, so-called fearless cities internationally are pushing forward, and I don't see why New York couldn't be part of that. In fact, I think it's absolutely imperative for New York as, you know, the biggest city in this country, which has been ruled by cars, you know, highway construction, fossil fuels, and suburbs for far too long to kind of advance this set of alternatives. Um, then last of all, on the medical industry, um, I've been thinking a lot about biocapitalism recently. Um, and when I say that, I'm thinking about the tendency of capitalism to commodify absolutely everything at every different scale. So, you know, right now, for instance, of course, geoengineering is very much in the cards. Um, and, you know, even on the left, people are starting to think about the necessity of geoengineering because, you know, we're at 415 parts per million. We're, we're really screwed unless we can get some of that carbon back into the soil. So people are talking about, you know, rewilding efforts, build, putting more trees up and the kind of political and economic implications of, of that um, and the danger of you know, furthering colon colonialism and expropriation, um, as well as you know, more um, technocratic forms of uh, carbon sequestration, you know, putting it in, in rocks uh, in Iceland, that kind of thing. So these kinds of scales of what might be called biocapitalism are definitely um, being considered and we need to think about it. And from that scale all the way down to genetic engineering of human bodies. Um, I don't know if you all have been following this, but there's this new technology called CRISPR, which allows genetic manipulation um, to uh, be done and to spread very fast through populations. So um, immunologists are starting to talk about wiping out Anopheles mosquito populations in order to get rid of malaria and other diseases. Um, there are powerful arguments to be made for this as mosquito populations spread as a result of climate change and bring malaria to other parts of the world. But I think we need to think very carefully about this and hold on to what the human might be in this new world of biocapitalism, right? Because if you can um, get rid of Anopheles mosquitoes, you can also use the same technology to engineer your child to have blue eyes or to be smarter than everyone else, a kind of Gattaca-style world, if you've seen that movie, um, that science fiction movie. So I think we um, need to think very carefully about issues of social justice and rampant inequality um, in relation to these new frontiers of biocapitalism and think about how we can push back um, and make sure that whatever forms of transformation of the world that we engage in, um, they do not increase 
um, inequality. Uh, and just to close with one example, the Gates Foundation is trying to push genetically engineered rice crops and varieties, right? Um, and uh, so instead of supporting local populations and their varieties, they want to say we're going to genetically engineer these new rice crops to be resistant to increased salinity and water. Um, and by doing that, hook people into a capitalist agricultural system. I think we can we can do much better, and we can support agroecology and local uh, varieties of seeds um, rather than um, having agribusiness shove its prerogatives down the necks of uh, the world peasantry. So, yeah. And then more questions. Okay. We'll also have um, a reception time until 9.30 so folks can talk with the panelists and whatnot. Can I say one quick thing? I, I'm sorry, I wanted to just make a fast pitch here. Like, if you wanna do activist stuff with New York Communities for Change, um, there's a sign-up sheet. And you know, we have cool campaigns. It's right over there. You can talk to me. You can get plugged right into like, making shit happen um, in a big way on climate change and inequality. We're, you know, we're not gonna keep piling up victories, but hopefully we won't pile up defeats either. Um, so let's do that together and sign up right over there. Uh, and also, um, you can come to our gala. Uh, we need money, that's on uh, the 23rd. Jamie's organizing it. So, so please come, it's on our website, uh, nycommunities.org. Um, we didn't get any money to do this work from foundations or large donors. Um, to do the building stuff that I just described. We're not getting any money for that. Um, it's all from small donations from sustainers like Ashley here who gives 15 bucks a month. Thank you, Ashley. Um, so no kidding, like, you know, um, please get involved, sign up, you can, you can do this. Um, we will do it together. It will even be fun and we can win, maybe. Cool, Brad. Um, yeah, so I, to replug Jamie's reference to sort of the Conid campaign, I'm also thinking a lot about kind of nationwide efforts to municipalize sort of public utilities or something along those, those lines. Uh, how, how do you all think about that going forward as a strategy and also what might it look like in less progressive places filled with more Republicans, uh, i.e. not New York City or Boston or San Francisco? What, what might those strategies uh, be like or are they strategies that are only really going to work in places that are sort of left strongholds? Um, so I just wanted to throw out that, that question. And then there were two there. Hello, buenas noches. I am Monica Carrillo from Peru. I am an Afro-Peruvian activist of human rights and I am also the community organizer of the Queens Museum. So I really would like to support this job and really, I am really glad that I'm here. But I just have a reflection. I just was watching this poster in the page number 24 of the magazine where I can see that there is a red skinned guy in the front, a woman in the second row, and a black guy on his knees supporting maybe a campaign. And from my perspective, this portray is a kind of very problematic, especially for the uh, representation of black people here. And because there is a black, no, um, a red, white maybe, or mixed or indigenous man in the front. So I think that this is something that is very important to reflect. Uh, I don't know if the moderator has any comment about that. Um, I don't know if the panelists saw this poster and if you have any kind of reflection about the racial perspective in this kind of campaigns, how we can really embrace the reality of our communities being aware of this kind of, rep of representations. Thank you. Um, I have... Um, Two small questions and a, a, I guess maybe a related question. One is I'm wondering if any of the panelists have any thoughts on carbon farming as or carbon cap, like or industrial carbon capture and sort of how their perspectives are towards that, like a decentralized or a centralized approaches to that. Um, secondly, it was, it was interesting to hear um, modern mon like modern monetary theory type arguments or come up in terms of the, the federal government's ability to pay for things. Curious if, if pan, the panelists think that the Green New Deal and this kind of climate action is an appropriate time for 
trying to change our awareness about federal monetary sovereignty and modern monetary theory type arguments. The last question or comment is, living in New York City, I often see um, existing regulations, existing environmental um, and, and social, all sorts of laws being ignored, non, uh, not lack of enforcement at a sort of executive level. We see this in all types of things in terms of racial discrimination, noise pollution, um, building violations, all across the board you see uh, fluorescent bulbs just thrown in the trash. There's no like enforcement. It seems like nobody has the time to even bother to enforce things. Similarly, just people in their lives, they don't seem to have time to care about their actions in this regard. I'm curious if if you are interested in answering in any of those, whatever strikes the spirit. Thanks. Um, so I want to, or yeah, we have one more. And do we have time for all these? Yeah. Okay. In the back. If you don't get to it, it's okay. Um, I guess if there's any thoughts on what you mentioned, a glo like an eventual global need for... I'm going to try to formulate this quickly. Um, just based off on what you mentioned earlier, but also any can reply, um, thinking about the initiatives and kind of, uh, I, I can't speak, but uh, very, very ancient. The work of native na uh, communities and nations is what I was trying to get at. Um, think you've all mentioned the state in relation to the state activist. Um, movements on a local level, as well as uh, trying to change the way this country works. Um, just any comments about this country as an imperial power currently, as well as in the past. And for example, when we're talking about native communities, these are communities that were not for uh, colonial borders, they are nations themselves. And from what I've heard from native people, want to be treated as a um, countries in their own sense, like these, these words do not really make a justice to what, what, what the um, native people of this land um, still continue to live, but anyway, um, there's, there's native science, there's native art, there is activism, there's all these things that are, keep already happening and somehow uh, none of this is really what we see at the front of um, environmental activism, as, uh, as uh, La Compañera was mentioning this picture. Well, exactly. Um, so yeah, just thinking about this. Because when we're talking about a global like green movement or something, just to put it very simply, this is also can, can rely on a, this um, impossible power, power dynamic that keeps happening with the US being a cultural um, call, uh, uh, imposer to, to, <laughs> to try to say something anyway. Okay. Um, okay, uh, so I'll start with your question about the, the picture. Um, I agree with you, it seemed a little bit problematic to me. I mean, I, I haven't spoken to the editors or to the artist about it, but it, it also struck me as an unfortunate kind of visual hierarchy. Um, and I think it particularly speaks to the absolute need to put frontline communities um, and environmental justice uh, movements um, and indigenous peoples in the forefront of the, the contemporary movement. Um, uh, and we don't have to look that far back to see why this is important, right? You know, I mean, um, Obama, President Obama, when he got into power, was talking about a Green New Deal, um, set it up in a way that involved uh, public-private partnerships that actually did not bring significant benefits um, 
to uh, frontline communities, right? Um, and so many of the environmental justice organizations that had backed his candidacy and been excited by his rhetoric about a Green New Deal became very disillusioned with him, um, as did the labor movement, right? Because a lot of the jobs that were created were, were not good, uh, well-paying jobs, right? So that history is not ancient history, it's very recent history. And as a result of that, I think, um, uh, many folks in the environmental justice um, movement are uh, speaking out very loudly at the moment, saying, you know, we need to be at the table this time, not sort of considered uh, in any kind of secondary way. And if it is a public-led uh, uh, transition, it has to be a just transition, and that idea of just tra transition can't just be rhetoric. Um, so I think that's absolutely essential. Um, in terms of um, your question at the back about indigenous communities, I mean, the same uh, point is absolutely important for indigenous communities. Um, uh, of course, uh, as a result of um, Native folks' courageous resistance to pipelines, um, they have been in the front lines of fighting fossil capitalism. Um, and uh, you know, we know that the Trump administration has been criminalizing that resistance and using the kind of war on terror um, and the repressive military apparatus, military police apparatus that's been developed ever since 9-11 to crack down on those communities. So it didn't, it didn't begin and end with Standing Rock. I mean, it continues in many places today. Um, so I think we need to think about being in solidarity um, with uh, indigenous brothers and sisters around the world um, and think about, um, reparations of various different kinds. I mean, what does it mean to think about reparations really seriously? Um, you know, land acknowledgements are really great, but how do we actually turn that into some kind of concrete material form of reparation? Um, and when we think about a global Green New Deal, um, you know, it has to involve massive technology transfer as well as material transfer so that um, indigenous communities don't end up just exploited again. And that's already happening, right? Um, for instance, in the south of Mexico, one of the most windy places on the planet um, has seen many big um, wind turbine corporations go in and get indigenous people sign 100-year leases on their land so they can set up wind power and you know channel it out to other parts of Mexico. So um, ending fossil capitalism does not mean we're going to be in some utopian state, right? The possibility for empire and colonialism and violence to continue, um, violence both, you know, direct violence as well as economic violence to continue is very real. So I would say we need to be thinking very much about those kinds of, those kinds of issues. Um, yeah, I would second everything Ashley said. I had not seen that picture, um, so I, yeah, I agree with what folks said about it. Um, but I also, I mean, just to add on to sort of how important um, sort of having indigenous folks take the lead on this, like the reason we have the 1.5 report um, from the IPCC is largely because people um, at UN Climate Talks for years um, from climate vulnerable nations um, uh, insisted that, you know, uh, there was this chant, 1.5 to survive, um, that the two degree target is simply too high, we need more ambition. Um, and I think that's, you know, I've been heartened to see sort of that, that be known, but I think, you know, I've been amazed going to, um, going to climate talks the last couple of years, um, just there's two totally, you know, different conversations happening among uh, folks who are, you know, largely from the global north, largely from very wealthy nations, um, and folks who are, you know, in places that are already being deeply, deeply affected by climate change. Um, obviously, there's, you know, variation within countries, um, but, you know, talking to um, folks, from, folks from the global south, um, it's incredible just how much more uh, in touch with the science folks are than, um, you know, you, like U.S. delegates in particular um, in those spaces. And so I think it's like, um, you know, there's been this whole conversation in the last week about uh, what the, um, you know, whether we can sort of go back as Joe Biden is sort of urging us to do to the Obama administration's climate policy. Um, and uh, at least, you know, 
for many reasons, in particular in the UN space, and, and you know, what international climate policy making has looked like, that is you know, an unmitigated, would be an unmitigated disaster. Um, and and you know, the US has consistently worked to undermine um, any uh, decent climate, climate policy at the international stage. Todd Stern, who was the negotiator under Obama, um, famously said on stage several years ago that if equity is in the Paris Agreement, we're out. Um, that if there's any sort of provision um, to make sure that there are, um, you know, a way to uh, have uh, global north countries who have built, you know, massive economies off of um, colonialism and extraction, um, make, you know, have any sort of sense of responsibility for that, that, you know, that is unacceptable to the United States. So um, I think that's all to say that, you know, any Green New Deal we think about, any sort of massive um, investment and in policy um, needs to actually take those, uh, take that fact really seriously. And that, like, even when the U.S. has been ostensibly um, an ally and, you know, believing in climate change, um, has reliably undercut um, many, many parts of the world. And so um, I think they're just has to be a sort of thorough internationalism to this um, that is not just sort of the internationalism in the kind of Eurocentric way that I think is, is generally thought about, but internationalism with folks who um, are, you know, have been not only sort of fighting for more ambition on climate for a very long time, but actually ha just have a better sense of the policy and have a better sense for what actually needs to happen um, in order to make these, uh, in order to decarbonize, um, decarbonize the global economy, which is, which is the goal. Um, I think, you know, somewhat related to that, um, this question of municipalization um, of electric utilities and, and nationalization, um, I think the question was sort of phrased as, you know, can this only work in, uh, in sort of blue parts of the country? What's interesting is that some of the, um, we have a lot of uh, municipal and publicly owned uh, electric infrastructure throughout the country that is by and large in some of the reddest parts um, of it. Uh, the rural electric cooperatives were this New Deal program created in um, the, the 1930s um, to serve uh, places which were simply not being served by uh, investor-owned utilities um, that you know, had not had service lines extended to them um, because the people were simply too poor. Um, and so uh, this New Deal program um, allowed folks to come together and essentially create their own electric utilities in, uh, with the idea that they would be these sort of self-sustaining Self, um, self-operating things that were, were, you know, owned and controlled by the ratepayers, um, and so those institutions have, you know, are many of them still exist. Uh, many of them are old boys networks, or uh, have devolved um, and become not very democratic, are uh, more dependent on coal um, than other, other sorts of uh, utility structures. And so um, I think there are sort of interesting sites to fight for democracy. There are you know, interesting cam campaigns for internal democracy within the electric cooperatives. There's also um, examples like Nebraska. Nebraska has an entirely publicly um, run uh, electric grid. Um, and so, you know, I think there, there are these sort of interesting, um, not terribly sexy examples of public ownership existing in, in the United States. Um, and, you know, I think that those are real, it's, it's an interesting um, site of political struggle in part because many of them are in um, places that, you know, voted for Trump, places that um, have been historically Republican, at least for the last several decades. Um, and so thinking about, you know, what is the sort of, um, what does it mean to, to give people sort of power over, um, over the way they turn on their lights? Um, I think that's, uh, yeah, kind of an exciting, an exciting place to look. Um, and, you know, campaigns like the one against PG&E, which has been found, uh, Cal Northern California Electric Utility, which has been found responsible for um, starting, fire, starting the wildfires um, in 2017, is like about to go bankrupt um, and could be um, a really, uh, you know, we'll see how the sort of bankruptcy um, negotiations work out and, and that'll be an extended process, but is a sort of exciting place to look um, to see if, you know, there is a possibility to, you know, break that up, to um, bring pieces of it under municipal ownership, to bring the whole thing, PG&E itself, under, under public ownership. Um, there's, you know, interesting work being done around that by um, climate and environmental justice groups in, in California. Um, and, you know, the DSA San Francisco has been active in that fight as well. Um, so I think that's, it's key. I mean, we can't, uh, the, the um, investor-owned utilities have been as actively, 
have spread as much disinformation about climate change as the fossil fuel companies. Um, they have been a part of the same coalition. As PG&E itself was a part of the coalition. Um, I think it was called like something anodyne, like the Global Climate Action Alliance or something in the in the 90s um, that you know just flooded um, UN climate talks, flooded the U.S. media. Um, with just mountains of disinformation about about this, and, and is you know t as guilty, if not more, of the as the fossil fuel industry. So investor-owned utilities um, certainly cannot um, exist in the way, in part because they're, they're, they have such a stranglehold on um, on our democracy, and have, have uh, really um, fought aggressively any sort of uh, renewables legislation. And uh, in the case of PG&E, which is in some cases considered sort of a leader. Um, on renewables, they have only done that because they've been dragged kicking and screaming um, by, by regulations um, at, at, the, at the state level. Um, and so I think, you know, investor, um, shareholder interests do rarely align with the public interests, and that is, is extremely clear in the case of, um, in the case of utilities. And it's, it's yeah, they, they really um, are a huge barrier to that. There are a lot of questions, but I want to stop talking. Uh, wise words from uh, Kate and Ashley. Sorry, I had to creep out of there. I, I always wonder at these panels, how do they not go to the bathroom during the panels, you know? And I never make it, you know? And like, I don't do that many panels, you know? But, but I, I Here's can never. Here's practice, Pete. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Adult diapers, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I probably shouldn't have drank a pounder before the thing, but that probably would have helped. Um, <laughs> Not, nonetheless, right, yeah, exactly. Um, nonetheless, those were wise words. Um, you know, I think about all these questions very organizationally. Um, you know, New York Communities for Change is uh, an organization that's fighting for economic and racial and climate justice, and we organize in black and Latino communities primarily. Um, our staff, our membership, overwhelmingly people of color. You know, I'm a, I'm a white person, I'm a white progressive. You know, I, I like white progressives. I, I am a white progressive, you know, but, but, um, but we're the minority in our organization. Um, and I, I think it's very important for groups like ours to be multi-issue organizations and multi-racial. Um, and so, there are organizations that think of climate change uh, in a siloed manner, um, or think of uh, abortion rights in a siloed manner, or think of um, uh, raising wages for working people in a siloed manner. Um, and I think that is a, you know, a, gigan a gigantic mistake. Um, uh, it's not that those organizations aren't doing worthy work. I think you know many of them are, um, but it's really important to have a a multi-issue perspective uh, on this stuff, which I think if you build an organization that is accountable with a leadership that is um, at a minimum multiracial and actually multiracial, um, uh, or uh, led by people of color, um, that's extremely helpful to, uh, to, to, to winning, actually, and to involving people in building the kind of uh, democracy that we want. Um, the, um, I had something profound to say, but now I cannot remember it. It was really good though, damn it. About nationalizing? Or oh yeah, we should, well, of course we should nationalize everything. That's Jamie's objective here. But, um, but, um, but yeah, on, uh, on to, the, to the point of, uh, yeah, Kate was, is, is really wise in the ways of like, you know, public owned utilities versus not. Um, I don't think there's a giant difference between operating in red areas or purple areas or, or blue areas, to be, to be honest. I, I, I don't think there really is. People are, are people, um, whether you're organizing rural whites uh, or, 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 or organizing uh, in a different neighborhood. Um, so I think it really comes down to the fundamentals of what do people value, how do you motivate them, how do you involve a group of people. Um, and so I wouldn't lead on climate change if I was in a uh, red state in a rural area, but I don't lead on climate change in a blue city either. Um, we lead on creating good jobs in the kind of society that we want. So, um, so I think that, that that's um, true everywhere, really. Um, so I, 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 you know, you don't you don't want to uh, piss people off as you're organizing them. Uh, you want to bring them in, but I don't think it's fundamentally that different. 
really. Um, I just want to address the two questions from that side. Um, today was my first time seeing that illustration, and I have to say I agree with your reaction. I had a similar reaction. Um, I don't work for or represent in these times, but maybe after the panel, Dayton, who um, organized this issue, can talk about the rationale behind that illustration and why it was um, centered that way. Um, and then as for your question, um, I'm an anti-imperialist. I don't think the United States should exist. I don't think Israel should exist. But the reality is that it does. Um, and settlers are here and colonizers are here. And our only way to move forward is to organize and for folks to agree on what to do, how to do it, and why we're doing it. Um, and then my a primary suggestion for you know, white Americans stepping into this work is to find existing work that's already being carried out by frontline communities because it is happening um, out of necessity, not out of interest, and um, you know, figure out how to support that, um, either materially by donating money um, or you know, providing the access and resources that they have that frontline communities don't, um, whether that's you know, connecting them to like national um, media, you know, publications or whatnot, um, and finding a way to support their work um, as settlers. And that's it. What? What? <laughs> It's a great question. I think it, we really want to create that because I actually think that's, you'd think with all the money pouring into fight it and climate change that there would be really good simple stuff out there to use. And there isn't. And it's sort of bizarre to me as, as far as I can tell. There isn't like a good 30 second, two minute, three minute kind of thing, right? Um, there's some stuff here and there, but it's not really on point to the way we talk about it exactly. Um, but, uh, but, but having said that, um, you know, I think it depends on your audience. Um, I like to send climate deniers at the NASA site. Um, that's kind of fun. Um, you know, but I don't know that it's productive, but it's fun for me. Um, and then um, in terms of very, the thing that motivated me um, to really think about this was um, Bill McKibben's article about the terrifying math of global warming. Um, it's a few years old. It's actually, everything's gotten a lot scarier since then. But, but I, um, I think that's the single best thing I've, I've read uh, about explaining this issue in a very concrete way. It takes like 10 minutes to read and it completely flip, flips you out. So um, that's, that's my top recommendation for thing to read. There are some random resources that are okay, but not great. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of great journalism being done. Um, Bill McKibben is one example of, uh, of course, Naomi Klein is another, and our very own Kate Aronoff is uh, another great example. Um, if you're looking for a very short video, in fact, Kate's work in The Intercept inspired a piece which Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Naomi Klein oh, yeah, that is produced, great. Yeah. which is, Sorry, you know, about a... About it's, yeah, it's, actually it's, great. it's about a seven minute long video yeah. which sort of has AOC reflecting, you know, in, in the future when she's about to retire from Congress, reflecting back on what it was like to be young and how the Green New Deal played out. So it's, it's kind of utopian and it uses the same trope that, that Kate used of sort of, you know, looking backward from a future utopian world and I, I think it's very powerful. Um, and then just to, um, for one second, toot my own horn, I did this book um, in 2016 called Extinction, A Radical History. History. And um, I tried to make it accessible, but also extremely radical. So it argues that the um, crisis of biodiversity is produced by capitalism, which is a system based on infinite expansion on a finite planet. Um, and as I'm sure you know, if you listen to the news, the United Nations has just come out with a really encyclopedic kind of um, publication that talks about the biodiversity crisis. And 
affirms the importance of indigenous communities where you know there's much less life uh, loss of um, biodiversity um, within those communities. Um, so I think it's important to remember that this is a crisis not just of climate change and increasing carbon emissions, but a multi-form crisis that's about humans' relationship with, with the Earth, with other living um, life forms on the planet, and with one another, and that we're going to have to fight this struggle on a lot of different levels. So um, some of the things which my fellow panelists mentioned are, are really, really great, but I think it's also important to, to think about all the different levels of the current crisis. Um, I have three. You should jot these down. Um, Obviously this issue, you can pick up multiple copies, um, but in particular, I would recommend the Kali Akuno piece. Um, he is an organizer with the Cooperation Jackson in um, Jackson, Mississippi, and he has a very rare talent of being able to simplify really big ideas and big concepts, um, and he writes with the bias to action because that's his main you know, role as an organizer. Um, the second one, which Kali Akuno was also involved in, um, and something I plug like every other day, is the first eco-socialist international. Um, it was, it's like a, a roadmap to eco-socialism um, written by multiple organizations and indigenous activists across the world. Um, and then the third one, which is like really quick and easily digestible um, visual is um, the Means TV, Means Production. They're a production company um, that's making like really short like 30 second to one minute videos breaking down like decolonization, um, climate crisis, um, like housing, just a bunch of stuff. So I would check out their page. Uh, yeah, I would agree with what everyone said. Um, it is really hard. I, as, a, as a journalist, I like am frequently looking for like, okay, what happens at two degrees, three degrees, four degrees, just to kind of, kind of put in articles. And it's hard every time. Like I, I have been covering this, this beat for like, you know, several years but now um, and still have trouble. I think, um, yeah, the video that the folks at The Intercept, you can find it at theintercept.com, um, did uh, Molly Crabapple, uh, Naomi Klein, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, put that together, um, is, is a great resource. Um, I think, yeah, Bill McKibben's article is really great. Um, I think, yeah, I, I will plug um, a series that I'm co-editing um, for Jacobin Magazine, um, where we are attempting to sort of, um, sort of put this in, uh, ha commission people to write pieces um, about, about this exactly, because I think part of why it's so tough to get folks, um, uh, give folks resources about climate change is because the conversation has not really, the climate conversation has been kind of bad at connecting with what it actually means for people's lives. Um, it is often about what it means for polar bears or coral reefs or like these sorts of things. And so part of our push is, is trying to um, really have, you know, that, that sort of conversation and, and you know, have uh, folks contribute like Kali Akuno did, um, who have been doing this work for a long time, um, and just you know create a space for that, uh, which the, this issue um, does really well as well. And we, um, the co-editors of that series, are coming out with a book from Verso, um, which should be out in October, um, so you can read that as well. It, the idea is for it to be a sort of short, um, you know, manifesto-esque thing, just kind of breaking down um, as much as we can in about 30,000 words. Um, so, you know, hopefully folks can pick it up in a day and, and get through it. So, yeah. Yay, that's it.